Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, especially to those that got up at these ungodly hours in the state. So welcome uh, all of you to this very special edition of the Topics in Complex Dynamics and also part of the um, intensive research program that unfortunately had to be postponed and half canceled or postponed for this month of April. Um, well, we would all like to be in Barcelona at this moment, enjoying the weather and enjoying uh, a presidential conference, but this could not be like this. Nevertheless, I think we have a fantastic program in front of us and, uh, and we will try to make the best out of it. We even have a social event on Wednesday, as you could see, and uh, we hope to enjoy that too. Um, so I have a couple of things to tell you, like for example, that all the, um, all the sessions will be recorded with the permission of the speakers. So for those of you attending, just be aware that if you participate, you will be recorded too. So if you don't want to, uh, if you don't want that to happen, so you will have to refrain for, from participating in the middle of the talk. I mean, uh, in general, I recommend that we all uh, mute ourselves uh, when somebody's uh, speaking, but to make it as realistic as possible as it's usual in our conferences, as you know. Um, so if somebody wants to say something, I think, unless the speaker asks, asks otherwise, I think we are all welcome to participate and make it a live event. Um, let me also say that we will take a picture every day at a different time so that at the end, everybody can be um, like photoshopped in so that everybody appears in one or another and we can combine them. And today the picture will be after uh, the, at the morning, during the morning coffee break. Okay, so I will say so and uh, so everybody that do doesn't want to appear can also switch off uh, his or her camera and, and just be sure not to, not to be um, present at the picture. Um, well, I think I have um, nothing more in the practical set, uh, side of it. Just uh, I want to thank uh, all the personnel at the CRM that has uh, worked hard to make this happen. Also to all the local organizers like David, uh, Jordi, uh, Xavi, Tony. Uh, so if you have any practical questions, you can address any of us and we will be happy to, to help. So I will, if there's nothing further, um, I will start introducing the first one of our, uh, to our mini courses. So today we have the pleasure of uh, having Phil Rippon and Gwyneth Stallard from the Open University. And they will speak first Phil and then Gwyneth with a 10 minute break in the middle um, on, on harmonic and sub, sub harmonic functions. So Phil, whenever you want, you can share your screen. Here we go. Um, I'm not seeing it work? yet. Yeah, this works. Are no, you not? Perfect. Right, good, 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 good. Um, uh, thanks, Nuria, for the introduction, and thank you, thanks to all the organizers for, for this very nice conference and for um, organizing it online uh, and for the invitation to give this mini course. Um, so these two lectures are about the applications of harmonic functions uh, to uh, transcendental dynamics. And I'll, uh, the first lecture will be a very quick tour through harmonic and subharmonic functions. I'm really going to start at the beginning, so I'm aware that I have in the audience people who know far more about this subject than, um, uh, well, me, and, uh, and I hope they'll bear with uh, and, uh, as we get uh, to the second lecture when Gwyneth will uh, demonstrate some applications of harmonic functions to transcendental dynamics. Okay, um, so the first slide is the definition of harmonic functions. 
uh, which couldn't really be simpler. A, a, a function's harmonic if its Laplacian is zero. I'll only be looking at harmonic functions in the plane for obvious reasons, but the, the whole of this theory can be developed in higher dimensions and indeed more generally than that. Simple examples. Uh, the, the, a common example we often use is X, which is positive harmonic in, in the right half plane, Y in the, in the upper half plane and so on. But the uh, things start to get going when you look at analytic functions, both their real and imaginary parts are harmonic by the cauchy riemann equations. And one striking example that comes up a, a lot, it will come up a lot, is to look at the real part of one plus Z over one minus Z. Uh, which I've evaluated for you there. This is a function that's harmonic in uh, the whole of the complex plane apart from the point one, but in the unit disk, uh, mod z less than one, it's positive uh, and it's vanishing on the boundary except at the point one where obviously it has a singularity. Uh, this is the Poisson kernel in the unit disk and we'll see uh, uh, lots of applications of the Poisson kernel. Uh, another way you can get harmonic functions is by starting with an analytic function and taking the logarithm of the modulus of f of z. Obviously, that's the real part of, of log f. Um, that's harmonic everywhere except the function where the function vanishes, where it, has a, it goes to minus infinity. We'll see in a minute that that allows it to be subharmonic. You can also take the argument uh, of f of z as long as you're careful and only do it in a simply connected domain that doesn't contain a zero of f. So for example, very often we, we, we use the fact that log of mod z is harmonic in the complex plane minus zero, and the argument is harmonic in, for example, the, the cut plane. Let's see if I can uh, move forward a page. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, a fundamental tool in harmonic functions is the Poisson integral. So supposing you've got a function which is harmonic in, in, in a domain D, so for me a, a domain is a connected open set, and you have some disk whose closure lies in D, so illustrated in the picture there, then you can represent your harmonic function. So just like with an analytic function, you can represent it using the Cauchy integral. Well, with harmonic functions, you have a somewhat different integral, but you represent the harmonic function inside using its boundary values that's h of z naught plus r e to the i. Let's see if I can point here. Yes, I can. So there are the boundary values of the function on, on, on the disk. And here is a kernel, which if we look below, defined uh, here it's defined in the unit disk. So it's the real part, it's, it's like the function on the previous page, zeta plus z of the zeta minus z is this. You should think of zeta as being on the boundary of the unit disk and z being a point in the unit disk. So this is the Poisson kernel. Uh, I gave you a particular example on the previous page. And for a general disk d, we scale the, 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 z, the, the z coordinate, but we allow each of the it to run around the unit circle. And this we have this representation. You can get that coming out of Green's formula, for example, <coughs> various ways of proving that. But this is a sort of standard representation we have. A particular case, an important case, is when the point Z is at the center of this disk, H of Z naught is then quite simply the average of H around the circle. So this is the mean value property of harmonic functions. It's a special case of this Poisson integral. But you can turn the Poisson integral round. You can say, well, okay, I, I haven't got a harmonic function. I've just got a continuous function on this boundary of the, the disk. But I can feed that continuous function into the same formula, and out will come some harmonic function. Um, and if, you're, uh, if you feed in a continuous function, f, as the boundary values, then that harmonic function will behave itself. It will as you tend towards any particular boundary point zeta, the limit of h of z will be f of zeta. That's for a continuous function. If the function f is not continuous, this may happen, at, this will happen at some points and not at others. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. So what we've done there is to, is to solve a particular case of what's called the Dirichlet problem. And the Dirichlet problem I'll say a lot more about later, but essentially we've specified some boundary values and inside we found a harmonic function which has those boundary values. That's the, 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 uh, the conclusion there. As I say, later we'll solve the Dirichlet problem in much more general domains, but that solves the Dirichlet problem in a disk. 
So coming out of the Poisson integral is a, 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 a thing called Harnack's inequality for positive harmonic functions. So suppose our function H is positive harmonic in a disk, dz naught r, um, and we have a point in the disk which is um, whose distance is little r from, from the center of the disk. Then we have this inequality that we can bound the value of h at any point z uh, in terms of the value of h at the center of the disk uh, above by r plus capital R plus little r divided by capital R minus little r and below by the reciprocal of that. Um, so how, do, how, would, how would one prove that? Well, once you've checked that it's true for the Poisson kernel, as I sort of illustrate briefly down below, then you can get it by simply integrating those inequalities uh, for any function uh, on a disk that's slightly smaller than the, the disk of radius r, and then let that radius tend to capital R. A nice corollary of this is that uh, if you were to take, if, if, you were, if someone were to say they found a harmonic function which is strictly positive in a whole complex plane, then you would be able to prove that was incorrect. The function would have to be constant simply by applying the Harnack inequality on larger and larger disks. So uh, positive harmonic functions can't exist on, on, on the whole of the complex plane unless they are constant. Now, uh, we'll see applications in Gwyneth's talk of Harnack's inequality itself in, in slightly interesting, in inter interesting contexts. Um, but we'll also see applications of a thing called Harnack's theorem, which is in very different ways in different texts. Um, but essentially, what you have here is a sequence of positive harmonic functions defined on a domain D then there are two possibilities. Either the sequence must tend to infinity locally uniformly in the disk, uh, in, in the domain, that's one possibility. If it doesn't tend to infinity locally uniformly, then there must be a convergent subsequence. So this is a sort of normal families kind of conclusion. There must be a subsequence, HNK must tend to H for some harmonic function, and it must converge locally uniformly. If you knew that the sequence HN was also monotonic, then the convergence would be along the whole sequence. Uh, but uh, in general, all you can say is that there's a subsequence. So this is, a, a, as I say, a normal family's kind of conclusion. But in the context of uh, positive harmonic functions, I should be better emphasizing that there are theorems which are true for positive harmonic functions, which are certainly not true without the word positive. Okay, so we'll see applications of that to, to transcendental dynamics in Gwyneth's talk as well. Okay, a few facts which um, are worth saying at this point about positive harmonic functions, which I'm not sure if we'll see the ap applications of them, but they're worth saying at this point anyway. So if you have a, a general positive harmonic function in a disk, uh, I think here I've said the unit disk, so this notation uh, D, uh, blackboard bold D is, the unit disk whenever I use it, then any positive harmonic function can be represented with a Poisson integral. So this is the standard Poisson integral for the unit disk, the um, one I defined earlier, um, with respect to a measure on the boundary. So instead of having your continuous function on the boundary or your values of your harmonic function on the boundary, what you have got is a positive measure on the boundary. Um, so, and in the op opposite direction, I suppose, if you have a positive measure, uh, you can put it on the boundary and define a positive harmonic function that way. But that's the most general type of positive harmonic function there could be on the unit disk. And from that representation, so uh, this representation will be obtained by, again, taking disks which are slightly smaller than the unit disk, using the boundary values there, the, 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 the analytic boundary values there to define a measure and then taking the weak limit of the measure as the radii tend out to one. Um, that's a sort of straightforward application of, of convergence theorems for uh, weak limit type theorems. Um, uh, a harder theorem to prove, I think, is to show from this representation that the function H would actually have, although it's a general positive harmonic function in, in the disk, it actually has finite angular limits almost everywhere on the boundary. So this is a version, I guess this is often called Fatou's theorem, for positive harmonic functions. 
The original Fatu boundary theorem is about bounded analytic functions, but this is a comparable theorem for positive harmonic functions. Um, and, and, and the proof of that is, is considerably more, well, it, it's, it involves breaking this measure up into its uh, absolutely continuous part and its singular part and treating each of them separately. Just a couple of warnings, well, not a warning, but um, people who know Lindelof's theorem for analytic functions will, will, will know that radial limits or indeed uh, um, um, any limit along a path implies an, an equal angular limit. This is not true for positive harmonic functions. Although these functions have finite angular limits almost everywhere, a radial limit doesn't imply an angular limit. You could have a, a rather unsymmetric behavior going on at the point and with a radial limit, but not an angular limit. Okay, angular limits are often called non-tangential limits. And I guess the reason for that is that in higher dimensions and the word, the phrase angular limit doesn't make sense, but non-tangential does make sense. Another nice thing is that if, if, if you have a bounded harmonic function, then it will, uh, you can, it will have bounded uh, uh, limits almost everywhere. And you can use this representation uh, much uh, as you would if you, as, if you had a continuous uh, values on the boundary. The function will be equal to the Poisson integral of its boundary values, which is often a nice thing. Okay, um, now I, I shall talk about subharmonic functions. Um, so subharmonic functions are like harmonic functions, except you only have sort of half of the, the conditions work. Um, um, uh, on one side only. So the first hypothesis is that uh, you allow the, the, the subharmonic function to be take values minus infinity, but not infinity. Instead of uh, prescribing it to be a continuous or indeed analytic, you just prescribe it to be upper semi-continuous, which is sort of half of continuous. And uh, you have a one-sided inequality. Instead of having an equality, you have a, 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 an inequality. Um, so the value at the center of each disk in the domain of definition is less than or equal to the average of the function around uh, any circle centered at that point. So although for most applications in analytic functions, you can just assume um, continuity of your function. In general, they're defined to be upper semi-continuous. What does that mean? It means that the lim instead of the limit of u of z, as z tends to z naught being u of z naught, you want the limb sup of u of z to be less than or equal to u of z naught. So you can't approach on a sequence z naught with values that go above u of z naught in the limit. Um, so it, it's saying that on the whole, the function uh, near z naught is less than or equal to z naught. An equivalent definition is that these, these sets are open. So that's, again, half the definition for continuity. Um, I, I, item three I've, uh, I've said here is that these two properties, two and three, have a balancing effect. So the first one says that near a point Z0, U is not much bigger than Z0. And this one says that near Z0, it's at least big enough so that its average is bigger than U of Z0. So those two things sort of balance out to say that actually these functions are almost continuous. Um, and there's a lot of there was a lot of work done early on as to exactly what that means. And uh, most ways you approach Z0, the function's going to approach the value at Z0. A couple of technical things about upper semi-continuous functions. Again, you get sort of things related to continuity. So if you have a compact subset of your domain, then the function will take a maximum. Uh, it'll take its maximum value on that set. You can't say it'll take its minimum value, but you can say it'll take its maximum value on that set. And if you actually, if you need any continuous functions nearby, because you can do something with continuous functions that you can't do with upper semi-continuous functions, then you can always take a decreasing sequence of continuous functions that would converge to a given upper semi-continuous function. So, uh, so that, that's the, the definitions of, uh, uh, of uh, the definition of a subharmonic function. Let's see some examples. And the key thing to note is the connections with analytic functions. So you can imagine introducing subharmonic functions sort of for their own sake, um, but they were principally uh, introduced early on because uh, many results which are true for analytic functions can be proved 
similarly for subharmonic functions and indeed the subharmonic proofs are often uh, very enlightening and, and there is much more than that but that's that's kind of one of the things we have to look out for so certainly if you've got a harmonic function that will be subharmonic and its modulus will be subharmonic um, if you can add them which is nice you can take the sum of two or a finite number of subharmonic functions and the maximum of two subharmonic functions is subharmonic this is very useful as you'll see in a moment there's quite a close connection that will keep appearing between subharmonic functions and convex functions, convex real functions. And you can, for example, take a subharmonic function and, and, and apply a convex increasing function to it. And you will get another subharmonic function that will come very easily out of the definition. Um, and an example if, if um, um, okay, so there's an example where you in fact apply that. The number five is the, the most interesting ones, I think, here for us today, that if f is analytic, then the following functions are subharmonic. Certainly log mod f is going to be subharmonic. We don't worry about it taking the value minus infinity when f is zero. That's not a problem. Um, but we can also take log plus of mod f, which is the maximum of log mod f and zero. Um, and and that, that will uh, be of, of significance later on. Um, you can take log plus of f to a power p for p greater than or equal to 1, mod f to the p for p greater than or equal to 0. So all these functions are subharmonic, which is kind of nice. And the one which crops up a lot is that if you have an analytic function f, you happen to know that u is subharmonic on the image here, then u of f of z will be subharmonic back on this domain d. So you, you can, they behave nicely in, in connection with composition and analytic functions. Um, and as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll point out a couple of occasions when, 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 that, that, when we're using that fact. Um, the, it, it, the, the trickiest part of that proof is, 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 is proving the mean value inequality at the critical points of F. So at points where <laughs> the non-critical points of F is pretty straightforward. But at the critical points, you actually have to do some calculation. OK, um, so <clears throat> there is a maximum principle. I could have stated this with harmonic functions, but <clears throat> it works perfectly well with subharmonic functions. So here we are. Um, suppose we have a subharmonic function in a domain, D. And suppose whenever you go to the boundary, to any boundary point, including infinity, if it's unbounded, supposing you um, um, uh, know that the limit of uz is less than or equal to naught at all those points, then you can conclude that you must be less than or equal to naught in the whole domain. And the only time you can have equality is if u is uh, within the domain, is if u is identically zero in D. Um, this is, I should say, this is the first maximum principle I'm going to state. Later, there'll be another one. Um, this is the one that's, <clears throat> in a sense, nearest to the standard maximum principle for analytic functions. Um, all the boundary points are included. Later, there'll be an extended maximum principle in which you don't have to check this inequality at all boundary points, just most of the boundary points. Uh, so in particular, that works, <clears throat> excuse me, for harmonic functions. Um, but uh, uh, yeah. So I, I mentioned the connection between subharmonic functions and convexity. And this maximum principle gives us, uh, if you like, a first example of a convexity property of subharmonic functions. It's called the harmonic majorant property. And the picture really tells it here. If you have a domain D in which U is subharmonic and a compact subset of D, then supposing you have a function which is a function h which is continuous on k and harmonic in its interior um, and that u is majorized by h on the boundary of k then u will be majorized by h throughout k in the interior as well now why do i say that's a convexity property well if you think of the one dimensional analog of this um, and we say to functions convex if when we look at its boundary points at the end of an interval and take a harmonic function uh, with those boundary values, a harmonic function in one dimension is a linear function. Um, so if a linear function takes the same values at the endpoints of the interval uh, and 
when it always dominates the function in between, then we say that the function is convex. So this is analogous to convexity in one dimension. But it goes much further than that. Here's an application below um, to the maximum. So supposing you've got a subharmonic function u, which is subharmonic in the whole complex plane. Uh, this, this, this function u is supposed to be subharmonic in the whole complex plane, or at least in, a, in, in an annulus. Um, inches below, uh, but B of R is a maximum of that function on a circle of radius R. Um, so it's not the maximum of the modulus of the function, let me emphasize, it's the maximum of the function. Many of these definitions you should think, how does this compare with analytic functions? Well, for analytic functions, we look at the maximum modulus. But now we know that log of the modulus of F is uh, subharmonic. So here where B of R is, is like log of M of R for, for an analytic function. So what can we say? Well, <clears throat> supposing U is subharmonic in a closed annulus, by which I guess I mean in an open neighborhood of a closed annulus, then it is the case that capital B of R, this maximum, is less than or equal to the linear function linear in the sense of a linear in log r, a log r plus b, which has the same values, boundary values, i.e. the same values at r1 and r2 as b. So this is uh, not convexity, this is log convexity. In other words, um, when you look at your function, um, it's uh, uh, convex with respect to linear functions of log r. So this is the exact analog for subharmonic functions of Hadamard convexity. In other words, the Hadamard three circles theorem, where you compare the maximum modulus on a circle between R1 and R2 with the maximum modulus on R1 and R2. So th th this plays a, a very big role in the theory because you can do much, much more with that function than if you just know that it's increasing. Okay, and that comes out of that harmonic major and property. It's, it's, it's a precise application to that closed annulus. Okay, um, so a big question that I mentioned earlier on is the Dirichlet problem. So given a domain <coughs> D and a function, which I've put said is continuous in brackets, because it won't always be continuous, but in the basic statement of the Dirichlet problem, we usually say F is continuous <coughs> on the boundary and real value. We find a harmonic function H on D with the boundary values F, the given boundary values F. So as you go towards the boundary point, every boundary point zeta through D, uh, H of Z tends to F of zeta. Um, that's the problem. Um, the first remark is that if you have got a solution, something that satisfies that, it must be unique. Uh, you can apply the maximum principle to the difference between any two proposed solutions. The next remark is a warning that you can't always solve this problem. Um, I said, given a domain D, the domain D could be multiply connected. It could, for example, be the disk minus a single point. Um, and then here we have the disk minus a single point, the punctured unit disk. If we specify these values, different values, zero on the outside of the disk and one on the inside, then there will be no solution to the Dirichlet problem in that case. Essentially, the boundary point at the origin is just much too thin to support uh, a solution. Often people think of um, harmonic functions, the graphs of harmonic functions as, as soap films. Um, uh, this is a, a kind of thought experiment to see what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And being able to support a soap film of height one at, at the origin when it's zero on the boundary does not seem uh, at all plausible. And indeed, you can't get a harmonic function that does that. I'm going to briefly outline <coughs> how the Dirichlet problem can be is solved. Um, this is one method of solution. I think it's probably the first <coughs> very general method of solution. There, are, there, there are others. It's called the. It, 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 it uses something called the uh, Perron families. Oscar Perron was the person that came up with this. 
Um, and I've written PWB, you'll see on the next slide that stands for Perron, Vina, Murillo, who are all contributors to this method of solving it. So it, it goes in two steps. <clears throat> the first step is to construct the only possible solution. In other words, you, you go through a process which, if it uh, is a solution, um, it must be the only possible solution. Um, the second step, as you've seen above, um, not all domain, we could go through this process with the problem in remark two above, and we wouldn't get a solution because, because there isn't a solution in that case. We'd get a function, but it, we wouldn't get the solution. So step two is to give regularity conditions on the boundary of the domain so that the function h of f you got in step one actually is the solution, or, or it, to some extent is the solution, anyway, is, to the, is the solution to the best possible extent. So let me... Um, move on to the Perron Vila Brillo um, uh, uh, theorem uh, that's day to day. Okay. Um, uh, uh, right, so we start with a continuous function, but we start with a function, not a continuous function necessarily, <clears throat> from the boundary of D to um, uh, an interval, little m capital M. Uh, I, I just think at this point, maybe I should check that people can still hear me. Nuria, um, am I still going okay? Uh, yes, from time to time it breaks a little, but for now it's perfectly followable, at least uh -oh. on my part. Yes, Thanks I agree. So it's the same. Yeah. Thanks very much. That's very useful. Um, I have once talked for 20 minutes to, to nobody, and so I like to check, should have checked earlier, really. Um, right, um, so, so now we have a function uh, defined on the boundary, and it takes its values in this bounded interval, little m, capital M. Um, and uh, we, we look at a family of functions, capital U of F. So this is a family of functions defined in terms of our boundary function. Um, and these are subharmonic functions. So the Perron families consist of subharmonic functions, and um, they have boundary values which are at most f of zeta. So the limb sup of u of z as you go to any point zeta on the boundary is less than or equal to f of zeta. So that's a well-defined family of functions. The, 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 the functions, uh, the function f had bounded values, so there's certainly plenty of uh, subharmonic functions which are constants in this family. And then you take the supremum over all the functions in that family. And the assertion is that that supremum is a harmonic function, always. And it always has values between little m and capital M. So um, as a result of coming up with this, there is a Perron, um, he's taking the extremum to a problem. Uh, he's optimizing, in a sense, uh, a problem. And he came, there's something called the Perron paradox which is that um, when, when you are solving an optimization problem, the first thing to be absolutely sure of is that there is an optimal solution to the problem um, before you start making arguments about what properties the optimal solution has. So um, he, he may well have um, been motivated by the construction here. I, I, I'm obviously not going to go through the proof. There's a sort of a page of argument here, but the key, the key fact is that you take functions that are in your family, in your Perron family, and whenever you've got two of them, you take the maximum of them. You can take the maximum of them and that'll still be in the family. And then the other trick you can use is to turn your subharmonic functions into at least partially harmonic functions by doing what's said in the lemma here. So you can take a subharmonic function uh, in a domain, take a closed disk inside the domain, then you can extend, these are the boundary values on the, uh, of that closed disk, this is the Poisson kernel we mentioned earlier, you can extend the function inside that disk using the Poisson integral, and it will then be harmonic inside the disk, and take the, the original function outside, and there's a little bit of checking to do to show that things behave nicely as you go across the boundary of the, of the disk, but everything works and the new function is subharmonic in D and is bigger than the function you had before. So the whole idea of this proof is to creep up on the harmonic function HF said, the one you want from below by taking functions whose boundary values are not too big, uh, 
using this Poisson modification, taking maximums of, of all the functions in the family whenever it's convenient to do so, and, and produce at various points increasing sequences of harmonic functions on disks. And then you can use the Harnack theorem from earlier on that says that if you have an increasing sequence of harmonic functions bounded above, it will converge locally uniformly to a harmonic function. So that's the, that's the way that that kind of argument goes. And, and, and it's clear here that subharmonic functions are playing a big role in solving a problem that where subharmonic functions didn't appear at all. Okay, so that gets you to the function which might be a solution. You've now got to try and impose conditions on the domain so that actually it, it will work. Uh, it will give you the right boundary values. Uh, th this is all a bit technical, but I, I'm giving you a bit of this here. So supposing you've got a domain and a boundary point, then zeta naught is regular for the Dirichlet problem. Um, it, it basically means that if you've got a solution, um, it, 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 well, this is the definition of regular for the Dirichlet problem. Um, uh, there exists a neighborhood, well, let's point at the diagram. There exists a neighborhood of the point zeta naught and in the shaded part, there will be a subharmonic function which is negative and which tends to zero at zeta naught. Um, and uh, for example, that wouldn't have been possible. It wouldn't have been possible to find such a function in our example earlier on, which where there wasn't a solution to the Dirichlet problem. But the function omega is called a barrier. Um, and when it exists, as we'll see, the Dirichlet problem can be solved, at least at that point. So there's an example. If you take the complex plane, the, the, the cut, com the slit complex plane, and you're worrying about the boundary point zero, then take the real part, take z to the half, take its real part, that's in the right half plane, take minus it, and you get a negative subharmonic function that tends to zero at the origin. So why is this regularity condition useful? It's useful because if zeta naught is a regular boundary point of a domain, and if f is also continuous at that boundary point, so I did up above on the previous slide, I didn't require f to be continuous, but if f is continuous and it's a regular boundary point, then the function found by the Perron method will converge to that boundary value at that point. Okay, so that's all in terms of the existence of a barrier, which is a rather intrinsic thing. Which domains are in fact regular for the Dirichlet problem? And the good news is that all simply connected domains in the plane are regular for the Dirichlet problem. Um, and we like working in simply connected domains, so it, 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 this is a very good thing. It's essentially because you know, if you take any boundary point of a simply connected domain, there'll be a continuum in the complement. And a continuum is, is a good fat set, which is quite big enough to um, 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 allow you to construct um, the subharmonic function uh, that's required to, pr to prove regularity. The story is very different for multiply connected domains. So multiply connected domains may be regular for the Dirichlet problem at, at some boundary points and may not at other boundary points. Well, we've seen one example already, but even if points accumulate, you know, if there are limit points, uh, it might still be the case that uh, a boundary point is not regular for the Dirichlet problem. That's a much more complicated story. Okay. Um, I said earlier on, there's a maximum principle and then there's an extended maximum principle, sometimes called a generalized maximum principle or a strong maximum principle, uh, uh, different names for these things. Um, but essentially you, win, you, give, you give away a bit and you gain a bit is what goes on here. So our subharmonic function is now a bounded above subharmonic function. So that's a very big constraint. On the other hand, if you look at the condition here, lim sub u less than or equal to naught, we don't require it everywhere on the boundary. We allow that to be a small set E, um, um, uh, which is defined below what it means for this set to be null, also called harmonic measure zero. Um, and as long as lim sub is less than or equal to naught for the zetas that are not in E, then, well, u is less than or equal to naught, and it's either strictly less than naught or it's identically naught. Um, in, in the same conclusion as stated differently as in the other maximum principle. So what does this null mean? 
<clears throat> well, this is one way to state it, but uh, E is null. <clears throat> I said A is null with respect to D. If you can find a positive harmonic function in D such that P of Z tends to infinity as Z tends to zeta for zeta in this set E. Now, this, this is, it's actually a little bit subtler than that, but <clears throat> this, is, this is good as a, a sort of working picture of what a null set is. And down below, I've shown you how to construct uh, such a function P <clears throat> in a bounded domain when you've got a countable set on the boundary. And this countable set is frequently what we have as our null sets. I mean, in general, a set of capacity zero is null, but I haven't time in this talk to talk about capacity, I'm afraid. Uh, so any countable set in the boundary will be null. Um, I've said that extends to unbounded domains. Well, it extends to many unbounded domains. I, I can't really go into the details of exactly which ones it works for here. But that's the picture you should have. If you've got a countable set on the boundary and the boundary is reasonably big, for example, if it's uh, simply connected, then that will be a null set. Um, right, if we get on here to talk about harmonic measure. So we, the, the end of the talk will have various um, uh, results which depend on harmonic measure. So harmonic measure, <clears throat> I mean, it's got the word measure in it and it is a measure function. So if, if, if you have, a, again, as ever, a domain and a boundary set E contained in uh, the boundary of D, and if the relative boundary, the endpoints, if you like, or the, 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 the relative boundary E dash to V and delta D is null with respect to D. So for example, D might be the unit disk, E might be an interval, an arc on the boundary, and uh, it's the endpoints of the arc that would be counted as the, the relative boundary there. Then <clears throat> this function omega, um, which has three um, uh, entries in it, there's a, a, a Z and an E and a D, and they all contribute to this. So this is the unique positive harmonic function in D, which has three values. One, essentially on E, apart from its relative boundary, and zero, as z tends to zeta on the complement of the closure of e in the boundary. So it's essentially one on e and zero off e. And at the relative boundary points, you don't know what it is. It, it, it will have some kind of mixed behavior at those points. And that's called the harmonic measure of e uh, uh, of the set e in the domain d evaluated at the points there. So uh, a harmonic function defined everywhere. So the pick towards points of E, the function tends to one. If you go towards the red dots, you can't say anything. Uh, there'll be some kind of variable behavior depending on how you approach it. And off the set E, the function tends to zero. You can, it's called a harmonic measure and you can think of it as a measure because if you fix Z, then it will be a positive measure on the boundary. And indeed that is uh, a very useful way of thinking about it. You can generalize the Poisson integral using, using this measure though I'm not going to talk about that now. Um, it, there are cases where it's simple to evaluate the harmonic measure, and, and I've given one here, which is, or well, relatively simple anyway. So this is the, this is the unit, a disk um, with an arc E on the boundary. Um, earlier on, I said that the argument of Z is a harmonic function, and the argument uh, and arguments uh, or angles are used to define uh, harmonic measures in simple situations like half planes and so on. So here, uh, if, you, if you use some, what I used to call school geometry, but I'm not sure it always appears in school geometry these days. Um, if you take your point Z in the disc and find the angle that's subtended by the arc E, call that theta of Z, take twice of that, subtract the angle that E subtends at the origin and divide by two pi, then magically you will find that that gives you, first of all, a harmonic function because theta of Z is, is actually the difference of two angles with respect to fixed lines. And um, it's harmonic. And if I've done my sums right, it 
tends to one on E and it tends to zero off E. So there are some simple examples, but mostly evaluating harmonic measure is not possible directly. And therefore we have to spend a lot of time um, working out how to uh, estimate harmonic measure. So here are a, a few results in that direction, which are, there are many, many uh, interesting results about harmonic measure and Garnett and Marshall, I, I'll put some books at the end, Garnett and Marshall have written a whole book about harmonic measure. Um, so there are uh, huge numbers of facts, but in terms of results that um, we have used recently, um, well, all the time you use the domain extension principle, which uh, the, the idea here is that if you have some, therefore you only know certain facts about it. You want to estimate a harmonic measure, so you extend the domain a bit until you've got something that you can estimate the harmonic measure in because you have some control over it. So here you might want to know the harmonic measure in D1 and you extend D1 to D2 and you look at a point Z that's in D1 and you've got a bit of boundary of D1 and then there's a monotonicity about, harmonic, about the harmonic measure there, which comes from the maximum principle. Um, uh, so extending the domain, the, the domain gets bigger. So this is named after Carleman. It's the domain extension principle. Carleman was a, uh, one of the great Swedish analysts uh, in the early part of the last century. Uh, and, and, and well, there is the Donjois Carleman Alfors uh, uh, theorem. Uh, the, he did a lot of stuff on harmonic measure in relation to that. In particular, uh, there is an estimate here, which uh, I think this is the estimate that you can find in Suji's book, in fact, which gives you an upper bound for harmonic measure in terms of quantities, this theta, which are related to the geometry of the domain. So if you look at the picture here, um, I have a bounded domain. I've chopped it off at radius capital R, F below capital R, D sub capital R. I have a point Z in that domain. And then the arcs that cross it, circles of radius R, centered at zero, all um, contribute their length. Uh, so the length of theta of R, that intersection, is R times theta of R. So theta of R here is essentially an angle, because this is, this is all happening out at radius R. If in fact, the, the domain is quite general. So if in fact um, it contains circles of radius R, then um, um, they don't contribute much. They don't contribute significantly to this kind of estimate. So we take uh, a theta of R to be infinity there so that they won't definitely won't contribute to the estimate. And now if you look at the, the estimate, if you look at the estimate, you find that supposing theta, this angle is really rather small. So it's a very thin, uh, long domain going off to infinity, it's unbounded. If theta is rather small, then one over theta is rather large. So this integral is rather large. So the end will be really very small. But this is giving you a way of saying how particular has a particular type. Um, and knowing that the harmonic measure is very small will tell you that if you have, by the maximum principle again, that if you have inside this domain uh, a subharmonic function, which is, uh, for example, one of the form log mod f, which is bounded on the boundary, then it, it must grow correspondingly quickly. And the thinner the domain is, the faster the function must, must grow. That comes out of the maximum principle and this harmonic measure estimate. Okay, I have another uh, result here called Loewner's lemma at the bottom which uh, turns out to be very useful. You can find a version of, there are various versions of it in different places. You can find one in Alfors conformal invariance, for example. Okay. You're mapping one domain to another and a boundary set E1 to E2. So F of D1 is contained in D2, F of E1 is contained in E2, uh, at least in some sense. I think the simplest thing is to assume the sense of continuity. Then when you evaluate the harmonic measure at Z of E1, and you evaluate the harmonic measure at F of Z of E2, then you find it's gone up. You've mapped F forwards and, and the harmonic measure has gone up. You can have equality as long as E1 consists of every possible pre-image on the boundary of E2. Um, 
that the harmonic measure goes up. And this, this you will see is extremely useful in something that Gwyneth is going to talk about. Right. Uh, my final... Sorry, Phil. Um, Hello. Can I just double check the function? Hi. The function f here um, is just any. So, sorry, what are your hypothesis on the function f? Analytic function, yeah. Any analytic function. It, it, sorry, it's analytic and it's continuous enough to make the statements work on the it makes, makes sense. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I'm finishing with a, a, a kind of rather big theorem that that illustrates a lot of the um, techniques I've been talking about. So this is a Wieman-Valeron theorem. There is a, a theory called uh, Wieman-Valeron theory due to Wieman and, and uh, well, started by Wieman and Valeron at the beginning of, of the previous century, which essentially what aims to show that entire functions are quite similar to polynomials in some places. So what you do is you look on circles of radius R centered at zero, you look where the function takes its maximum modulus and somehow near there, the function is behaving uh, like a polynomial. Uh, but with Walter, we, we, we had a, a paper in which we generalized uh, that to the situation where you have a meromorphic function, for example, but you have what's called a tract, an unbounded component uh, uh, of um, mod f z greater than r, uh, in which you have a subharmonic function log mod f of z over r uh, inside the tract and zero outside the tract. So that function log mod f of z over r will be zero on the boundary of the tract. So you extend it to be subharmonic and zero outside. I should say this function has, meromorphic function has no poles inside because I'm saying that you, uh, inside the tract, because I'm saying that f is, uh, well, this is subharmonic. And then we look at b of r, which is the same b of r I was talking about earlier on. And we take a point z sub r, where u, where, where u takes its maximum, um, and uh, you can, that's a convex function of log r, so you can differentiate it at least in most points uh, and get a quantity called a of r. Then the, the great fact, uh, which is analogous to what was proved in the original wieman valeron theory, but here we're in a tract, is that if you take a disk center zr of radius r divided by this little a of r essentially, um, a of r is tending to infinity, as you'll see below, so this is smaller than r, this quantity. Then the image of that disk under f covers a large annulus. It covers an annulus um, who, whose size is essentially mod f of z of r. Uh, there are, don't worry too much about the constants here, you can take them to be particular values. But it's, it's a very strong statement about how the, this, this disk actually lies inside that tract and that the function f uh, uh, takes d and covers a whole annulus uh, uh, when it's applied. And the proof uses a, a very large number of facts about subharmonic functions, in particular that b of r is log convex. But it also uses the facts under item two here very strongly that B of R, which in general, because the unity, but it's a theorem of Wolfram Fuchs back in oh, the 80s, I think, where he settled the question of Donald Newman by showing that this ratio must tend to infinity and therefore the little a of R must tend to infinity, uh, which makes sense in terms of the size of these disks here. So we use a large number of facts from subharmonic functions in the proofs of this, uh, uh, many of which I haven't had time to mention today, but in particular that Kahneman estimate for harmonic measure plays an absolutely crucial role. So I think I've slightly gone over time here. Uh, my last slide is um, just some books that people can read. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you for the very nicely prepared talks. And the speaker this time is uh, Gwyneth Stallard, and uh, she will continue with some applications of uh, harmonic functions to transcendental dynamics. Thank you. you can so, start um, whenever thank you, very, you want, Gwyneth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nira, for um, the invitation to speak and for all the work organizing. Um, and it's lovely to see everybody and we're looking forward to seeing everybody in Barcelona properly. We spent the weekend remembering all our favourite places in Barcelona. We're sorry not to be there, but um, it's great to see people online anyway. 
Um, so as Nuria said, I'm giving the second part of the um, course. Uh, so Phil gave an introduction to harmonic functions in the first lecture. And uh, in my talk, I'm going to give some examples of how, how we've applied these to problems in transcendental dynamics. So we're illustrating some of the techniques that we've used. Um, OK, so I'm going to start off with um, just some, since this is the first talk which mentions transcendental dynamics, I'm just going to uh, mention some um, uh, basic definitions and things with, in, in transcendental dynamics before I get onto the applications of um, harmonic functions. OK, so everything I'm talking about, a uh, function is going to be transcendental entire. Um, and that that is the usual definition. So we're looking at iterating uh, transcendental entire functions. We're looking at the set of points where that's actually continuous in the neighborhood of Z, points to iterate close together. Julia set complements the Fatu set, just so they've been on the screen once, probably, um, and the escaping set, um, set of points which escape to infinity under iteration. Uh, and one of the Key questions about the escaping set. Sorry, it's just on the bottom of the slide. Hopefully, it's not disappeared. But Aramenko's conjecture that all the components of the escaping set are unbounded, which has sort of driven lots of work um, in transcendental dynamics over the last um, decade or so, I guess. Okay, so that was a quick, um, just so they've been on the screen once. Uh, and the next thing I want to talk about just quickly is the fast escaping set. Um, and Lots of the things that I talk about involve the maximum modulus function also the minimum modulus function. So the maximum modulus function, we take a circle um, of uh, radius r and we look at the maximum modulus of our function on, on, on that circle. Um, and then what we're interested in doing is looking at um, um, the iterates of our function. So if we, if we look at applying the maximum modulus repeatedly, and as long as we start off with our R sufficiently large, then this iterate will tend to infinity. So what do I mean by this? I mean, if we take our circle of radius R, and we look at the maximum modulus in that circle, we should get a, a bigger value. Then we take a circle of this radius. So this is R, this is M of R. And then we look at the maximum modulus of function on this bigger circle, and that will give us a bigger circle again, which we'll write as M2 of R, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the fast escaping set, the core of that, the points we're interested in, the points which start outside our circle of radius R, then it maps outside M of R, then it beats the maximum modulus again, and maps out here, and so on. So we keep on staying out. We're escaping to infinity as fast as possible. Okay. So let me put the definition up. So this is a set which is introduced by Alterberg, Weimar, and Hinkinen in 1999. So this is a, just a set of points that I just described here, a set of points which when you iterate, you beat this um, iterated maximum modulus. Um, and then the fast escaping set itself, we take this set and all its pre-images. And once you add in all the pre-images, it doesn't matter what value of R you started with, as long as it was sufficiently big that when you keep on iterating, you tend to infinity. Okay, and then what's really nice about this set is it had lots of really nice properties. Um, so some of these were sort of stars that were observed in the original paper, and Phil and I also um, did lots of work on these. So I just pick out a couple here. So the one is that the Julia set is the boundary of the fast escaping set. Uh, and the other really, really nice property is that all the components of the fast escaping set are unbounded. So Aramenko's conjecture on the escaping set is still um, open. But for the fast escaping set, we know we have this nice property that all the components are unbounded. OK, so that's the fast escaping set. Um, then I just want to give a, a couple of properties related to that and related to the maximum modulus. OK, so these next results appear in a paper of Phil and myself and joint with Walter Bergweiler, which is actually about uh, multiply connected warning domains. And I'll talk about um, some of the results from that paper in a minute because we use harmonic functions a lot in that paper. Um, but on this slide, I just want to give some properties related to the fast escaping set and the maximum modulus, which we which we proved at the beginning of that paper, um, or we um, have there. So the first one um, is a convexity result. So there's a, there's a it's a nice version of um, Hadamard convexity about what happens when you look at the uh, maximum modulus for a function and how that relates at different values of r. So you get this really nice relationship here that the um, log of the maximum modulus of uh, r to the c is greater than to c times the log of the maximum modulus of r. And 
uh, if you have your given function, then you, you have this, um, there's a, there's a, as long as your R is big enough, then this is true for all C greater than one and all N. Um, so that's a really nice, useful result. It's a very neat, clean result that we use a lot. Um, and the second result that um, we use, this is really based on uh, Alex Aronenko's proof that the escaping set is non-empty. Um, so his original proof back in 1989 was based on Wien-Valeron theory, which Phil talked about at the end of his lecture. Um, so the classic Wien-Valeron theory holds for entire functions, and um, the, the result that Phil was talking about, that our joint work with Walter Bergweiler, um, extends that to a more general situation. And the points that um, Aronenko constructed in his original paper were actually in the fast escaping set. And if you look at that proof carefully, you can you can show where these points are. So if you um, uh, if you have your uh, you have a circle of radius r, and you want to see how close to this circle of radius r can I find a point in, that that um, escapes. Uh, the, the iterated maximum modulus relation in relation to this particular value of r. Basically, if we take another circle a bit bigger than that, so I've put r times one plus epsilon, then inside this annulus here, as long as our starting value r was big enough, we'll be able to find a point in ARF. So that means that it, it, that's going to iterate forward faster than the iterated maximum modulus at this circular radius r here. And the larger we take r, the, the smaller we can take epsilon. So we can take smaller and smaller annuli um, in which we're going to find a point that iterates off like the um, uh, iterated maximum modulus. Um, so this is a really nice result, which follows from uh, Aramenko's original proof. And uh, we call them Aramenko points. And they have, they have really nice properties, not just that they iterate like the um, iterated maximum modulus, but if you take a small neighbourhood, then that will iterate and it will cover annuli um, in a really nice way. Okay, so these are useful properties of the um, maximum modulus. So I've talked a bit about the maximum modulus. Next thing we'll talk about is the minimum modulus. So the minimum, minimum modulus of your function is defined exactly the same way, but we take a circle um, of radius R, and we look at the value of the function on that, and then we take the minimum value of R, the modulus of our function. So uh, lots of functions that you look at, say the exponential function, the minimum modulus on a circle is going to be um, quite small, and as R gets bigger, the minimum modulus is tending to zero. Um, but there are lots of functions when you can find lots of uh, circles on which the minimum modulus is actually um, quite close to the maximum modulus, so your function is quite big on the whole of the circle. Um, so it depends on what types of functions you're looking at, what values your minimum modulus can take. Um, so the maximum modulus is obviously nice. It gets As R gets bigger, the maximum modulus gets bigger. The minimum modulus um, has um, not so nice behavior in it. When, as soon as you, if you have a circle and it's a zero, then your the minimum modulus is obviously going to be zero. Um, but yet you can have other circles for lots of functions. You can have other circles where the minimum modulus is very close to the maximum modulus. So this this minimum modulus can go up and down. Um, or say for something like the exponential function, it can just tend to zero. So you can get different types of behavior for this. Um, but what I'm interested in is functions where um, the minimum modulus is often close to the maximum modulus, so um, or it is in part of the plane. So, okay. So th this lemma is looking at the case when we have an annulus. Um, so this is an annulus um, from r to the a up to r to the b, um, and which and inside the whole of that annulus, annulus, we know that the minimum modulus is greater than one. So we're not looking at an exponential function because this would, uh, but we're looking at a different kind of function, but we know the minimum modulus is bigger than one in the whole of this annulus. And actually what this result tells us that provided, you know, we have certain conditions on our uh, A and B, so the annulus is big enough, um, is that we get the minimum modulus is actually quite close to the maximum modulus. So I've put a condition here. Um, okay, the key result, thing to look at is this um, result at the bottom. So it says we started off with an annulus, sort of fairly big annulus, then it was one, then it went from a power of R to a different power of R. 
all we assume is it was the minimum which is bigger than one, actually we can deduce that the minimum modulus is very close to the maximum modulus in some slightly smaller annulus. So I, we, we started off with R to the A, we we're going to come in a little bit at that end and then they come down a little bit at that end. And I said what delta is here. Delta in this case, delta is one over and we have these various conditions and this one is really just to make sure that when we take the smaller annulus um, it's my empty so um, we, we want a plus 2 pi delta to be less than b minus 2 pi delta okay so um, this is a really useful result that we um, we use a lot kind of that we if we know the minimum modulus is bigger than one in some annulus if we take a slightly smaller annulus we can deduce that the minimum modulus is very close to the maximum modulus and you could take a different, for this application, we wanted to take that, this value of delta, but we could, we could take um, different values and, and then we get a slightly different result here. Okay, and then one other really nice thing is that if we have an annulus like this, um, not only is the minimum modulus very close to the maximum modulus, but actually that tells us that the function is behaving really nicely kind of inside this small annulus. So inside this, smaller annulus here we have the function it's behaving like a monomial so it's a really nice um it's behaving really nicely and the function the size of the function is very close to the maximum modulus everywhere inside that so this is um, a very useful result okay so that's my sort of background section on kind of basic definitions in uh transcendental dynamics and a bit about the maximum modulus and a bit about the minimum modulus and then I will do what I was supposed to be doing, which is to talk about applications um, of harmonic functions to transcendental dynamics. And I want to basically talk about two um, applications. Uh, actually, sorry, before I do that, I was going to talk about the proof of this lemma. I remember now. Okay, before I do that, I'll talk about the proof of this result. So, how do we um, do this? Okay, so. I've got this situation where we have an, an annulus in which um, the minimum modulus is, is uh, greater than one in an annulus, and we want to show that it's actually close to the maximum modulus. So the first um, step we do, and I say this is a really nice application of using harmonic functions, is that we look at um, u of z is log mod f of z. Because we know that the function um, f of z mod f of z is greater than one we're certainly there's no zeros around so this function is positive harmonic in this annulus here okay and then the next thing we do is just a sort of change of variables and instead of looking at this annulus here we're going to look at this strip here so we're looking at u, capital u of t is u of e to the t so we've replaced the annulus um with um, the inner radius r to the a, this is going to go to a strip, um, which is, so we've got, I'm sorry, we've got a log r here and b log r here. So if we map that by e to the t, we'd go up to the annulus, and we're looking at everything inside this strip s here, and inside this function, our u is positive harmonic. And then the next thing we're going to do is to use one of the results that Phil talked about in his talk, which is, um, Harnack's um, inequality, which says that if you have a, um, if you take a, a, a point somewhere where you um, uh, then, and you take a, a disc in which your function is positive harmonic, and you can compare the size of um, how big your function is at other points inside that disc, depending on how, um, how far away they are from the center. So the reason this is useful is because we want to, our uh, result, we want to show that the minimum modulus is close to the maximum modulus. So we want to take two points on a, on a circle in our original annulus. We want to show that basically the function has the same kind of, we want to get the, the size of the function is very similar. So if we've translated that into this strip situation here and at log mod f of z, we want to show that that function is, behaves and has very similar values if we take a, a, a line down there. Okay, so, so this is what I just said. Basically, we're going to apply Harnack's inequality on a disk, and we're going to take a point. Um, we're going to take a slightly smaller disk than, than so we know that we have our, our function is harmonic on this disk S here. We're going to come into a slightly smaller disk here, this one S dashed. I'm going to take a point 
um, T1 in there and then do exactly what I just drew that we're going to take. We're really interested in what happens if we take another point on the um, with the same real part, which means that it basically comes from uh, points on the same circle of radius of the same radius in our original annulus here. And we want to show that the values of the harmonic function um, at these two points are actually very similar. Okay, so right, I've got, my, I've got a picture here. There we are, lovely. Okay, so this is our, our point T1, which is in a slightly smaller annulus. We take our point T2, uh, which came from the same circle in our annulus, and then we um, look at what's going on here. So around our point T1, we can definitely take a circle of radius um, 2 by 2 pi delta log r, because that's the width of this um, that we've come in by here. So we know if we go out by 2 pi delta log r, then we, we will still be inside s. And our point T2, because it's on that, we, we can take that to be at most pi um, away from T1, because it's just on the same circle that, um, in the annulus. So that means we're comparing the value of our harmonic function u um, on a, inside this circular radius um, um, pi here, when we know that the function is harmonic on, a, on the circular radius. 2 pi delta log r, which because of the fact we cho chose delta to be 1 over the square root of um, log r, that's the same as 2 pi over delta. So if we just put in the results into Harnack's inequality, we take the uh, radius of the larger disk, which is 2 pi over delta, um, we have minus radius of the smaller disk, which is delta, and on the bottom we have the radius of the larger disk plus the radius of the smaller disk, and we get this inequality here. So then we go Follow back up the uh, slide there, and that was going to tell us that the plugging all that back in that the minimum modulus is um, greater than the maximum modulus to power one minus delta, which is what we wanted. So that's a really nice applicable inequality there. Okay, so and this is the result which we'll use in the in, in later in the talk. So now I really have done my introductory bit and I will go on to the applications to uh, transcendence. And they're both to do with wandering domains. So I'll just very quickly say what a wandering domain is. Um, so um, I realise we're at the conference on transcendental dynamics, but just so I've got a slide that has this um, and I'm the um, first speaker talking about wandering domains. So um, they have a component of the FATU set. Uh, and we, uh, this is, I'm going to use this notation here, the um, UN for the components fatty set, which contains F to the end of U. Um, and when we say a component is a one domain, if these are all different um, whenever N is not equal to N. So we never map into a periodic cycle of fatty components. We always just keep on mapping from one component to the next component. Um, so there's an example there where the function z plus psi z, and we've got a fatty component which maps to another fatty component which maps to another one, and so on, and so on, and so on. Huh. So this obviously this example here is very nice and kind of, but um, in general these monuments could be really complicated, and there's a whole load of questions that lots of people are working on. So there's lots of things that we can ask about these. Um, so the first. Um, application I'll talk about is applications to multiply connected wandering domains. And actually, these were the first types of wandering domains that were discovered. So they were discovered by Noel Baker. Um, uh, a long time ago. Um, and uh, after he proved his first example, he proved really nice general results. So that basically saying that if you have a for a transcendental entire function, as soon as you know that your fatty component is um multiply connected then you know that your function is on your component of the wandering domain um, and you have really nice properties so they, so they might do all kinds of things to start off with but eventually you're going to get a sort of sequence of nested rings which are drawn here so um so it might wander around for a bit but then you're going to get a, a, this annulus which might have holes in it surrounding the origin which will map out to a bigger um, ring here, which again might have holes in it, which map out to a bigger ring, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, whatever your function is, whatever your fatty component is, if it, as soon as it's got one um, hole in it, then it then it's going to eventually map into some setup like this. Um, so, the question is, what can you say about this setup? We know 
how periodic fatty components behave really, really well. We have them classified and we know how the dynamics are, but what can we say in this situation here? Um, okay, well, the first result I want to say is one by um, Zheng in 2006. So he showed that although you might have um, these holes, and actually, you know, there are, there are certainly lots of examples where you have infinitely many holes like this, and they, 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 these domains could look very irregular, but once you get out far enough inside this what could be a very wiggly domain and it could be very stretched and things. It was going to be a proper annulus um, here. And the modulus of this proper annulus that sits inside this um, fatty component here is going to get bigger and bigger as you go off to infinity. So that gives you some nice structure to these things, which all you know is they're kind of a ring which might have lots of holes in it, in which case out to infinity. Okay, so that's the background. And then so what I want to talk about is just sort of um, some of the insights that um, a fellow and I got with working with Walter Bergweiler, which is quite a big paper um, describing in quite some detail what happens inside these multiply connected wandering domains. So uh, if you have some of these multiply connected wandering domains, then uh, I think one of the key results we have in that paper is that. Um, not only do you have these proper annuli which sit inside your fatty components, but actually you've got a sort of sequence of absorbing annuli. So you'll have um, an annulus sitting inside this one, um, which is an which is good, and you've got another annulus in here, and, and so on. In each, you've got proper annulus. That, well, there's, there's various things about them. The one is that the, the they are actually quite big, so that um, you've, you've not only got the modulus tending to infinity, but you've got um, the inner radius, the outer radius is a power of the uh, inner radius, so that they're really fat annuli. And the really, really nice thing is that if you take a point uh, in, or if you take a, I'll get this next one up, yeah, okay. So if you take any compact set inside your fatty component, then it might be really near the edge to start off with. It, it could be anywhere here, but eventually it's going to get stuck inside these absorbing annuli and then stay inside these absorbing annuli. And actually it's going to settle down within those. Um, and inside these um, absorbing annuli, the end, the function behaves really nicely, behaves like a large degree monomial and the degree gets bigger as, um, as you go out to infinity. There are lots of other results in this paper, but that's a kind of uh, some of the, key things. And I just want to talk uh, a little bit about the proof of this, which is say does involve harmonic um, functions. Okay, so right. one of the key things about this uh, paper is that it looks at these um, positive harmonic functions inside um, our FATU component U. So they're kind of classic harmonic functions. Um, so we take log mod f to the n of z over log mod f to the n of z naught, where z naught is just some point we've chosen in u. It doesn't matter what to do, it's just some base point that we've chosen. Um, and uh, again, probably everything I should say, just maybe just assuming that n is large enough and we're in, we've got to the stage where we're these sort of rings that go around zero mapping out to another ring outside zero. Certainly for n large enough, we're kind of, the, the function is very large inside um, our fatty component u. This is definitely not zero, it's kind of so, uh, it's a positive harmonic function. And just because the way it's defined, it's equal to one at this point. If, for each value then it's equal to one at this point, z naught. <clears throat> and these functions are really a sort of key to trying to get um, hold of the, a good understanding of the dynamics inside our um, wandering domain. Okay, so okay, so the, one of the first things we can do is we can apply Harnack's theorem, which was in Phil's talk, and this is that we're going to have a there'll be a subsequence of these positive harmonic functions which converge to a positive harmonic function h of z in u. Um, and if we Look at this. I mean, we could have done this in a more general situation, but one of the, re the really nice thing about these multiply connected fatty components is that we can um, deduce that this 
harmonic function that we get here is non-constant. Um, and this is really using the properties of these um, multiply connected fatty components. So um, the sort of various ingredients that go into this. So um, right, the first the first ingredient is Zheng zero, and that tells us that we, if we have our multiply connected fatty component, we have an annulus. And again, if n is large enough, then we have an annulus inside it. Okay, and this annulus, the modulus gets bigger. So certainly for big enough n, we can assume we've got an annulus, um, say r up to four r. So let's take, split that, we'll take two r here. So we've got two r up to four r. The next thing we're going to do is to use this uh, Menko points lemma. That said, again, if we are is big enough, then somewhere between 2R and 4R, we're going to get a point here, which is in the fast escaping set relative to 2R. So this point here, which I'm calling Z1, and I'm assuming that this is, um, okay, I've got Z0 here and Z1 here. Um, so if I look at the harmonic function, uh, I should say HN, sorry about that. Okay, H N Z one. Well, I know sorry, it should be H. That's right. Okay. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. If I say H N, then I've got um, uh, log mod F to the N of Z one over log mod F to the N of Z and all that's just the definition. If I look at F to the N of Z one, then that's this Aramenko point, so that's behaving like that's beating uh, log n to the n of two times the modulus of mod z naught. So I've got hn um, is greater than equal to this uh, ratio here. And when I take the limit of this, because of this convexity lemma, the convexity lemma tells me that this limit is greater than one. So that's telling me that h of z1 is greater than one. And I know that h of z naught must be equal to one because h n of z naught is equal to one everywhere. So this function h is definitely non-constant because I've got this, I've got, I've got one point where I can show it's definitely bigger than one and another point where I know it's equal to one. So we've got a non-constant positive harmonic function defined in u. And once we've got that, then we can start to deduce lots of nice things about how um, our functions behave just by looking at the definition of the, of the functions h n. So that's really the key thing. I've got one more slide and I just, um, okay. Uh, but the bottom point of this, this is actually, there's a bit of work to do here. We had HN, we had a subsequence which depended to H, but actually we can show that the whole sequence of HN depends to H. Um, I'll talk about how we do that. But it's a summarized one domain U. Uh, and a sequence of uh, positive harmonic functions defined in this way, which tend to a positive harmonic non constant function in U. Okay. So, roughly speaking, just we can think that modulus, the modulus of FTN and Z is going to be close to the modulus of FTN and Z naught to some power H of Z for large N. So, that's sort of telling us that um, if, we, if we have our F to the n of z naught is on this circle, then um, F to the n of z is going to be on a, a well, if, if, if it sort of starts bigger than z naught, it's, it's going to end up on some circle. And the relative uh, size of this circle relative to this one um, is kind of settling down. It's going to be some power. The, the size of this radius is a definite power compared to this radius in the limit. So we're getting points are settling down to different levels, if that makes sense. So you, so depending on your value H, that, that tells you how the, the size of that point relative to the size of your base point in the limit. And it's just settling down at that nice limit. Um, okay, this, this is basically saying, uh, we're, we're looking at what happens if I take a point, um, okay, let me draw my um, one ring domain u here and i'm just going to take um a point in u and take um a circle around that so a, di a disc in there which lies inside u so that's what i've got um here and then i'm going to look at 
um, this function gn, so this is an analytic function, that the real part of which is the, um, the harmonic function h that I had. Um, we can show that we actually get gn tends to an analytic function g um, in uh, this disk. And using that, we can deduce that actually when we map this forward by um, f to the n, then just because of the way this is defined, actually it contains an annulus. As long as our n is large enough, it contains an annulus um, like this. And the, 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 here, and the important thing is that we get this power alpha. Um, it, 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 we have the same power alpha for as, as long as n is large enough. So we get a, 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 the little disk maps and it maps forwards and it covers it covers this annulus sort of centered at the circular radius mod f n z one, and it's a kind of nice thick annulus um, of a certain with the powers being fixed as we get for large n, or at least as big as that anyway. And then the next thing I'm just going to put on this slide is that um, if you remember that a few slides back, we had that if we had a, a thick annulus like this, in which we know that the minimum modulus is bigger than one, which we do here because our function, um, everything's going, we've got basically our one remains are going out to infinity. So the function is definitely bigger than one on this. Then we had that the function was actually close to maximum modulus, which we can kind of see from this function h anyway. But also we have this um, nice property that, um, the function is acting like a monomial inside this annulus here. Well, actually inside a slightly smaller annulus, I'm kind of waving my hands a bit here, kind of in this some details to sort out, but, um, but, but that's applying the level we had a few slides back that we've got this nice annulus here inside um, our, because it's a nice, it's now a nice thick annulus. This is this is thicker than the annulus which we had from the Zhang result, which was just that just told us that the modulus was 10 to 20. This is 10, telling us that we've got an annulus when the outer radius is some um, power of the inner radius. And that means that we can get this, apply this result and, and get the, the functions behaving like a monomial. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot more in that paper, kind of in it, uh, lots of different results, but this key thing really is this positive harmonic function H. And it, from that, you can get this really, really nice behavior. And the, so the key thing is that it's, it's non-constant um, and you get lots of nice results from that. Okay, so that's that result that I wanted to talk about. Um, and then I'm going to go on to the next thing. So that's one more application for um, the last part of the talk. So the previous results were all about multiply connected one domains. Um, when, so now we know we have really good description of what happens inside multiply connected one domains. Um, then in the last bit talk, I want to talk about simply connected bonding domains. Um, so Basso is talking in the next uh, talk, and she's talking about some of the work that um, uh, we've been doing with Nuri and Anna um, about what happens inside um, simply connected bonding domains and on the boundaries. If we, the question I want to talk about here um, is if you have an escaping wandering domain, so that means it's a wandering domain that's inside. Uh, the escaping set, and this, in fact, as soon as you meet the escaping set, your warning domain must be in the escaping set. Then, a basic question you could ask is okay, what about the boundary of um, your warning domain? Must that be in the escaping set as well? Uh, and obviously, if you have nice examples like the one I the picture I put at the beginning, that the one relates to sine z when you know, were just a boundary, then they just like, everything march forward very nicely then that was clearly the case. But you, these one domains could be really quite complicated and, and they could be coming more and more stretched. They could be doing, it's, it's not obvious that this is um, true. In fact, we still don't know if this is true. Um, so what do we know? Okay, so if it's multiply connected, the case I just talked about, then actually we, yeah, they, they go off really nicely to infinity. The whole one domain is not only an I of F, but actually including the boundary, everything's in the fast escaping set and they all go off really nicely. Um, um, more generally, what we know is that if you have a um, escaping simply connected one domain, then if you look at the set of points in the boundary, which aren't in the escaping set, then that set has zero harmonic measure. So we know that most of the points um, are escaping, but we still don't know whether all of them are escaping. Um, and what I want to do is just, and the last bit of this talk is just outline some of the key ideas that um, 
you go into the proof of this result, which again is based on harmonic functions and harmonic measure. Um, before I do that, I just want to say one corollary. This is something that um, Lassa pointed out to us as, uh, when we first talked about these results, and we had a, um, a we gave a statement that was quite a complicated statement, which was equivalent to this, but kind of um, didn't sound nearly so exciting. I remember at the end of Phil's talk, Lassa said, I don't have a question, I have a comment. Actually, what you proved is you proved I of F union infinity is connected, which was um, a really nice result, which we somehow managed to state in a completely um, way, which was equivalent, but not didn't sound nearly so um, exciting. So this is a nice result that you get out of this. The reason it comes out of this, if, we, if I of F union infinity was disconnected, um, then you'd be able to have a disconnect in gamma here, and you'd have a point in here that was uh, in I of F, um, and your gamma would be in the complement of I of F, and you'd have a point outside that was uh, um, in I of F. The, the different ways this could, could occur, if, if you, one way which, uh, before we had this result, in which this could possibly occur was that you had a, the, the inside your gamma was a factor component in I of F, and that this was, um, if, if gamma was the boundary of the factor component, if you didn't know that that had to meet I of F, then you could possibly get this setup. But actually, this says that you can't, this can't possibly, happen. this, this bit inside gamma can't be a factor component. It can't all be a factor set. Actually, you have a point inside here that must be in the Julia set. If you have a point in the Julia set, you know that's the boundary of the fast escaping set. So you'll get a point in the fast escaping set. The fast escaping set, all its components are unbounded. So we've got that that's in A of F. And then that's a contradiction because we've got a point in the fast escaping set, which is meeting this um, continuum gamma, which is supposed to be in the complement of the escaping set. So that can't happen. So this is a kind of nice corollary that comes from this kind of case that was missing before that. It's a very unlikely case where this failed, but, um, but it was possible. Um, one more result which I mentioned before I look at the proof of this first result here, which is a result in the other direction, which is kind of linked a bit to what Vasso is talking about later. So um, this is in the opposite direction. If you have um, you as a component of the, a factor component, and if you know that the boundary um, of your factor component intersect the escaping set has positive harmonic measure in you, then you can deduce that actually your factor component was in the escaping set. So if you know enough of the boundary is escaping, you can deduce that the, the um, component is escaping. The proof of that is simpler than the proof of the first one. So I'll look at the I'll look at the proof of this first one here um, in the last five minutes of the talk. Um, and um, just outline how we use harmonic functions, harmonic measure to talk about this thing. If you've got an escaping simply connected one in your main, then almost all the points in the boundary are also escaping. Okay, right. So I've got you as an escaping one in the main, and I want to prove that uh, the points in the boundary that if there are any points in the boundary that aren't escaping, they can have at most zero harmonic measure. Okay, so I'm going to pick an R and I'm going to look at that A N be the set of points in the boundary of my factor component, um, which after N iterates drop below R. Okay, and then I'm going to um, consider this set here, which is that f to the n of z is less than equal to r for infinitely many n. So if you're, if you're not escaping, then there's going to be some value of r for which this is true. So basically, the points which aren't escaping, I'm interested in the, um, the set of points which are in these set for um, some r. So if I can show that this set, if I pick r and I can show that this set has harmonic measure zero, then because I can get just look at counts be many different values well that will be enough to do my proof so what i need to show is that this set um has zero harmonic measure in you and i can write this set as this intersection of these sets a in here 
So I just need to do it for one value of R and that will be enough. Okay, so I want to, I want to um, get that this set here has zero harmonic measure. Okay, and the key claim to doing this, this is the key, the key sort of step of the rule is to show this fact here. If I look at, um, right, let me draw this. Okay, so this is my U, my wandering domain, um, and um, okay, this is, I'm going to look at my A in here, these point that after N is let's drop the A, um, have size less than R. And I want to look at the harmonic measure um, of this set, A N and U and N, and just sum that over large N and show that that has um, the harmonic, the sum of these harmonic measures is finite. So that's what I'm claiming is true, and that's what I'm going to show or outline why that's true on the next slide. Um, on the rest of this slide, I just want to say why, the, why this claim is enough to prove um, the result. Okay, so, okay. So, right, if we can show that this sum is fine, right, then that means that if we look at the sum, we look at the sum for n greater than to m, as we let m tend to infinity, that sum must tend to zero because we know this whole sum is convergent, so the sort of partial sums at the end must be tending to zero. And then that's saying um, that the, the, the uh, harmonic measure of the union of these sets, a n, um, n is greater than to m, the upper bound on that is going to be the sum of these harmonic um, measures here. Okay, and we're keeping an eye on this is what we're trying to trying to prove here. We're trying to prove that this intersection of these unions has harmonic measure zero. So, so the claim quite quickly shows that the harmonic measure of the unions um, is tending to zero. Given that we're now looking at a nested intersection, that's going to tell us that actually that um, the harmonic measure of this intersection of the unions is equal to zero. So once we have this claim here, this key result here, that the, um, some of these um, harmonic measures of these sets A, N, and U is finite, then that's enough to prove the result. And I'll just, that's the, so this is the last slide of the talk, is to outline how we prove this result here. Okay, so this is what we want to show. We want to show that the sum of these harmonic measures is finite. Okay, so the first step is um, uh, what um, one of these results, which Phil had near the end of his talk, I think it learned this number, which says that we're, so we're interested in the harmonic measure of A and in U. So we've got this is our U. Um, and then if we we're going to compare that with the harmonic measure in U and so U maps forward um, to U. N and we take a n. Um, so this is a set of points on U which maps to has size less than R when we map them forward into N. So we're going to call that set um, under um, E N here. Um, so this is a circle of radius R. Then okay, actually it's going to be all these points here. So Leibniz number says that the harmonic measure of an in u is less than the harmonic measure of um, en in un, and we get to the point z naught maps to zn here. Okay, we're looking for an upper bound on this harmonic measure of a and u. So if we can get an upper bound, if we can prove this result by looking at these sets here, then we can certainly reduce the result here. So we're going to, for the rest of this slide, we're going to look at the, the, this, this thing here, the harmonic measure of these sets, e and, um, and u n. Okay. Right. Okay. So uh, this, um, okay, this is uh, the key things here. Okay, so um, 
I've put a list down here of the sets we're looking at, and I've sort of drawn some of them here, but I'll finish drawing more. So we're, we're looking at this set. Delta is all the points. So this is the um, in the Riemann sphere. Delta is a set of points which have radius, um, I'm sorry, modulus bigger than R. So this sort of upper half sphere here. Um, I've drawn here. This is U. Oh, okay, let's get my pointer. UN is the um, so we've looked at f to the n of u and we get this um, fatu component um, un here. Um, it's soft off at the point z0, zn was f to the n of z0. If we take n large enough, we can assume that um, zn mod zn is bigger than r. Okay, right. So then that's what we do. We take, so en is the, um, this set of points in the boundary un, which are, have modulus less than equal to r so okay this is en here um vn is the component of un in set delta containing zn so it's this component here so let's see if we can just well this is a bit rough but there we are that's the um vn and fn is the boundary of uh vn intersect Set of uh, points with modulus equal to R. So let's get a different color for that. Okay, so this is Fn here. Okay, and then the key thing here is that by the extended maximum principle, which again Phil talked about, we have that the harmonic. Um, measure of Fn in delta is greater than to the harmonic measure of En in Un. Okay, and this is true for all points in Vn. So this is the, this set, this yellow set here is Vn. So the maximum principle says that basically, if we can show that that's true on the boundary of Vn, then it's going to be true inside Vn. Well, if we look at the boundary of Vn. On, on this point here, so on Fn, this measure is equal to one, whereas the other measure is less than one. Sorry, it keeps on disappearing. So that's definitely true here. And on this other bit of the boundary here, um, the remaining part of the boundary here, um, our original harmonic measure was equal to zero. So it's definitely less than or equal to the harmonic measure on the right hand side. So on these bits of the boundary we've just talked about, we have this inequality and therefore it's true for Z in the um, VN. That's why I'm rising, I'm going slightly over time and I've got, um, oh no, I started three minutes late, okay. And I've got one more slide. Okay, so we can, we've got an up bound again. So at each of these stages, we're getting an upper bound for our, that what we're actually interested in, which is this here, we're interested in the harmonic measure of A and in U. We've now got an upper bound for that of the harmonic measure of Fn in uh, Delta. Okay. So I've got the picture again there. And so that what we want to do, on the, this really is the last slide. Um, if we, we want to prove that the sum of the harmonic measures of Fn in delta is finite. And that will tell us the claim that we, we wanted, which was the key thing which we had to do to get our result. Okay, so um, very last step. So this, I'm going to choose my n being this, the, the, not only can I choose, assume that mod Zn is bigger than r, but actually it's bigger than 2r. And the reason for that is because I want to, um, I want to do this comparison here, which is a kind of nice trick that we want to, um, instead of Zn, because our Zn's are different for each n, I want to get, I want to choose a fixed point here, and I want to get some, I want to be able to compare it with infinity, so that each of these, instead of having a different Zn here, I've got the same point, infinity. And the way we do this, um, I, I remember Phil explaining this to me the first time when we were going through this proof, and I was always very mystified by this three. But anyway, so this is very useful for me, getting understanding where the three comes from. Um, we're basically just applying a Harnack's inequality here. So we have this, this is a harmonic function. And we want to compare the value at Zn with the value at infinity. And just to make it nicer, so we can see what's going on, we're going to do this transformation here. So we do Z goes to R over Z. So infinity goes to zero, 
um, R mod the circular radius mod R goes to one, the circular radius mod two R goes to the circular radius a half, and our point Zm here goes inside the circular radius a half. So that means that we can apply um, uh, Harnack's inequality with this um, circular radius one and a circular radius a half. And if you remember that told us that the, the ratio of the values at this green point and the red point was at most one plus a half over one minus a half, which is equal to three, which is where this magic three comes from. Um, so the very last step to do is to say, okay, um, but now because we've do this sum here. We've now got this relation here. We know that the harmonic measure with, re with respect to this point Zn is at most three times the harmonic measure at infinity. And now we've got all these harmonic measures at the same point at infinity. And the key thing is that we know these sets Fn are all distinct because they're all inside. Fn is inside Un. Un each Un is a component containing a one ring domain. So it's a different, so these are different sets for each n. So we've got a whole collection of sets on this circular radius R, oh, but they're different. So the, this, this, um, some of these harmonic measures is going to be most one. So we've got this three in front, so we get a three. So that is definitely less than infinity. And that completes the proof. Um, and I'm sorry, there was quite a lot in that, but it's quite, the, the ideas are kind of, we, we've sort of used them quite a few times and it's quite a useful, they're quite useful techniques for using to prove results like this. And the result is, the, well, certainly the corollary of the result is nice that you get the escaping set union infinity is connected. Um, so that's a kind of quick whiz through some sort of ways in which we've used harmonic functions to prove results in uh, complex dynamics. And um, hopefully those techniques will be of some use in other applications. Well, I'm sure they are. We're using them ourselves at the moment in different applications. So I will finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gwyneth, for uh...